Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series, and you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And today I am going to be doing an interview with one of the brightest human beings on the planet, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio just so I don't leave anything out. It uh, could be way more than I'm going to say, but uh, this guy is quite an amazing individual, and I'm very happy to be doing this interview right now. Can you hear me okay, Nathaniel? Perfectly. Wonderful. Okay, so who is Nathaniel Brandon? Ph.D., pioneer of the psychology of self-esteem. He's a practicing psychotherapist in Los Angeles and also does corporate consulting. Dr. Brandon offers workshops, seminars, and conferences on applying self-esteem principles to the problems of modern business. He addresses the relationship between self-esteem and such issues as leadership, effective communication, and managing change. Dr. Brandon has a Ph.D. in psychology and a background in philosophy. He's written 20 books, which have been translated into 18 languages. More than 4 million copies are in print, including the classic The Psychology of Self-Esteem, originally published in 1969. In it, he explains the need for self-esteem, the nature of that need, and how self-esteem or lack of it affects our values, responses, and goals. His many books, including Honoring the Self, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, The Art of Living Consciously, and a personal memoir, My Years with Ayn Rand, many of his books have been translated into foreign languages and worldwide have sold over 4 million copies. His most recent book, Self-Esteem at Work, deals with the application of his work in the field of self-esteem to the challenges of business in an information age economy, which is one of the many reasons why I was uh, so happy to want to do an interview with Dr. Brandon is because most of the listeners are entrepreneurs, and I believe he has knowledge and wisdom that would be instrumental. And if you want more information about Nathaniel Brandon, you can visit his website at nathanielbrandon.com, which we will talk about later in this interview. But nonetheless, uh, let me say, uh, Dr. Brandon, thank you for taking the time to do this interview. Uh, it's, I'm absolutely looking forward to it. I recently met you at a conference where you were speaking to doctors and therapists, and we had just by uh, luck, you happened to walk by during lunch, and I asked you to sit down and have lunch with me if you were available, which you were, and we had a great chat, and then I uh, gave you a ride to the airport so you can go back to uh, to your home in, in Los Angeles area, and uh, here we are now doing an interview. So anything that uh, I didn't say about you on the bio that you think would be important for the listener to know before I start asking you some questions? The only thing I can think of is that I have clients, both personal and corporate, but not confined to my office, but the majority of which are from people around the world, and the consultation is via the telephone. Wonderful. So you spend a lot of time talking to people all over the world because now... On the telephone. On the telephone, yes. Great, great. Well, you know what? I'm going to encourage people, you know, with before we even get any questions, if you've not read of, uh, any of uh, Nathaniel's books, uh, absolutely go out and do that. Uh, the book Taking Responsibility is one of my favorites. The Art of Living Consciously is great. And so there's so many different areas, uh, uh, Nathaniel, that I could ask you about, but I'm just going to really just ask you some that I think would be most applicable uh, to our listeners uh, to get a real good understanding of what you know and how, how it would apply to their life. So, uh, ready? Yes. Okay. So now you're referred to as a specialist on self-esteem. So I'd like to ask you, uh, what is your definition of self-esteem and why should uh, we care about it? Self-esteem is our experience of being able to cope with the basic challenges of life and as worthy of love respect, success, in a word, happiness. Think about it this way. If we knew someone who, whatever his other assets or virtues might possess, if we knew such a person who basically felt, who am I to know? Who am I to think? How can I be expected to manage this change? Nobody told me about this in advance. We would recognize that the person involved has got a self-esteem problem. Right. Or again, if a person communicated that they felt they don't really deserve to be loved, or they don't deserve to be happy, or they don't deserve to be successful, there again, 
surely it's obvious that you're talking about a self-esteem problem. So the two elements that I talk about, which we will call self-efficacy and self-respect, capture both sides of the aspect of self-esteem. For example, by self-efficacy I mean confidence in our ability to think, confidence in our ability to respond appropriately to the challenges of change, confidence for our ability to cope in general with the core or the basic challenges of life. And second, self-esteem entails the idea of feeling worthy of happiness, worthy of love. The tragedy of so many lives is they may have the talent, they may have the skill, they may have everything to succeed except one fatal thing is missing. They feel they don't deserve it. They don't feel not worthy of it. And therefore, they self-sabotage, self-destruct. Well, I was going to say that um, for these reasons, uh, I condense the whole issue into that one sentence. Self-esteem is the experience of being competent to cope with the basic challenges of life and as being worthy of happiness. Why is it important? Because if you don't understand clearly what the target is, you're not going to hit it. One of the reasons why psychologists have great difficulty teaching uh, self-esteem is because too many of them think it's just it's a they think it's a feel-good phenomenon. They think I feel good about myself and it's because it's a good self-esteem. If I don't feel good about myself, I got bad self-esteem. It's nowhere like that. It's not a high that you get from a drug or a love affair. If somebody told you that made you a compliment, so now your self-esteem is gone through the roof. That ain't self-esteem. It can be a pleasurable feeling. Lots of things can make us feel good that don't necessarily have anything to do with self-esteem. So I might get a new car and really love it and just love driving it. And it makes me really feel like I'm on a high when I'm driving it. That doesn't mean that it gives me my self-esteem. What gives me my self-esteem is more likely to be the mental operations that I performed in the in the context of my work that, that permitted me to, uh, to buy a nice car. Right. So uh, I'm happy to say, while there's a long road ahead, based on the emails that I received from my electronic world, uh, more and more people seem to be accepting and signing on for my definition of self-esteem and admitting that it really does cover the issue more, compromens- or more comprehensively than any other currently available. In the history of psychology, there were people who tried to make self-esteem an issue of just of competence or efficacy on one side, or in others who talked about worthiness the other side. I'm the first person to have ever brought the two together into one unified theory of self-esteem. Why that area? Why did you choose that area out of all the different... Uh, and, 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 I mean, you obviously are quite have quite an expansive uh, career, uh, but why self-esteem? I began to have a private practice very, very young in life. I mean, today it would be almost impossible. When I was 25 years old and working on my degree at UCLA, New York University, I was already had a, a few patients, and uh, I was always interested in what is it that the patients are doing right when they are growing in self-esteem, and what are they missing or failing to do right when they are falling in self-esteem. And it became like an empirical question. I felt like a detective trying to learn that one of the key issues that either results in self-esteem growth or diminishing. And uh, out of that came the idea of uh, the question, what the heck is self-esteem exactly? And then you just think about it and you be aware of what context in which you use those words. And you, after a while, you begin to realize what you're talking about are these two issues, the issue of self-efficacy and this, uh, the issue of being worthy and not unworthy or undeserving. It's simply an issue of paying attention to your clients, listening to what your clients tell you, watching the behavior and seeing those if there's a significant difference in how they operate in the world, that difference relates quite often to the level of their self esteem. And so you put all this together and you arrive tentatively at the definition that I propose, but then you start looking for exceptions. And in several years now, since I first put the definition into play, I guess it's more like fifteen years now. I haven't been unable to find any exceptions to the general idea that I put forth. Yeah. Now, can I ask you a question about worthiness? Because uh, you, you said that people feel worthy or unworthy. When, when someone feels unworthy or worthy, is that 
per se a choice? Is it because of something that happened to them that they're doing or not doing? I imagine, I mean, certainly I'm not a, a psychologist uh, by well, any means. for example, one of the first questions I'll ask a new client is, did you feel loved by your mother? Did you feel loved by your father? Uh, if the answer is no, the odds very much favor that there's going to be a self-esteem problem there because uh, it's not unnatural. It is natural to think that my own mother and my own father couldn't love me. What am I to expect from anybody else in this world? Consequently, the issue of worthiness has to do with, am I a good person? Am I a person that other people could respect or admire? And uh, at the same time, it doesn't mean that uh, anybody in particular you know, has to love me. Some people will like me, other people may not. That's a, that's a different issue. But um, it's a challenge in another way, too, that it should be mentioned, which is the following. See, if you're reasonably confident in yourself and reasonably confident in your, in your right to be happy, if you can do whatever it takes to be happy, if you can do that, then, then you meet somebody and you, you fall in love, let us say. Uh, it doesn't. It's not shocking to you that the person loves you back. In other words, that the, it isn't just you who love the person, but the person loves you. That feels kind of natural, and as it should be, and it's wonderful. But if instead you feel shocked, astonished, oh, no, this is a mistake, she doesn't know me very well, she really knew me, and if the person feels that she really knew me, you couldn't love me. And then that leads to almost losing respect for the person who got suckered and who admit, loves you when you knew you didn't deserve it. So naturally, what you're going to see there is a sabotage of the whole relationship. The person who feels unworthy or undeserving will find ways to prove that he's right by doing things which have the net effect of destroying the relationship. So would it absolutely be a true statement that you would not be capable of loving another human being if uh, you're, you don't love yourself? In the full sense of love, I would say that's correct. I would say not that you can't need the other person, not that you can't admire the person or the other way. But if there is no sense of one's own value, I can't even imagine how such a person could negotiate a successful marriage or a successful relationship. You see this all the time. People who are afraid of being alone, afraid of being abandoned, afraid of being left out, who uh, do things which would increase the probability that they will be left out because they turn people off by maybe too many self-deprecatory talks or referrals or... Uh, too many self-deprecatory statements, or too much jealousy, or too much, too many endless demands for more reassurance that you really love me, and you can drive a person nuts who started off having a really nice, lovely, wonderful relationship and went down the troops. Why? Because one or both people didn't really feel that happiness was their birthright. There are people right now who are listening to this conversation, listening to my voice, know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, just so I can make a distinction here, um, sure. I think it's really important for you know all human beings to not only focus and understand this message, what you're talking about. A lot of people that are listening because they're business owners that a lot of maybe never even you know visit a therapist or pursued any sort of development in this area, um, how would this apply to work? How would this apply to a business owner? Well, it would apply on many different levels. To begin with, the CEO or the company president sets the kind of pattern of what kind of an organization it's going to be. Uh, a leader or a CEO has to be a teacher in a sense. He has to be an inspirer, and he has to be working on the task that needs to be done and working on facilitating the people doing the task that needs to be done and understanding that it's not about him being brilliant. It's about him handling or bringing in people who can be brilliant. And whether you're a manager or a CEO, the principle is the same. Unfortunately, businessmen, pardon me, CEOs sometimes feel themselves in the popularity context with their own employees so that they want to make an issue of I'm right and you're wrong. And they're, out, they're eager to prove that they're right and to wipe the other guy off the mat. And uh, this is no good. It, it's a poison for a relationship of the person with the idea that he wants to put forth, for example. But he knows it's going to become an issue of the, the boss versus me. Not the, instead of the boss saying, well, this is very interesting. Let's take a look at this. Tell us more about it, Joe. 
Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned a book of mine that I wrote uh, a short while ago called Self-Esteem at Work, and I discuss many more examples of how it's a CEO self-esteem will be manifest because of the way that he manages. One of the things that you won't see is the, the senior person in an adversarial relationship with the people a little bit lower down on the ladder. And that more broadly, you know, when I do things sometimes for an organization, people don't initially ask me, how do I create a culture of promoting self-esteem in my company? What they do ask, how can I produce a culture in my business that will inspire people to give their best to the work? Those are two different questions, but the answer is interesting because the answer in both cases would be the same. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, that whether the goal is to create a culture of self-esteem or whether the goal is to inspire people to give their best, what you would want to do, the actions you'd want to take as the boss in the, or the senior people, whoever, is the same. Treat people with respect, learning how to be genuinely open to new ideas, creating a style of uh, organization and of, uh, and of creative activity requires a sense that I've got something of value to offer. I have to give my reasons, I have to give my grounds of my belief, but I've got something worthwhile to offer. I put it on the table, and maybe it will be shot down, maybe it should be shot down, maybe it's going to go somewhere. But what's important is what attitudes do we bring? Do we want the other guy to win, or are we only interested in being a winner ourselves? And that's still another aspect of how self-esteem shows up in a business setting, an organization setting. Whether you're kind of a really out to ask yourself what needs to be done, what needs to be done, and do that, versus who's to blame, who screwed up, what can go on forever discussing. Well, I'll just mention one more point. Studies have been done of business failure, and they find that one of the commonest problems or causes of business failure is executive fear of making decisions. But what's that? if not a fear or a lack of confidence in one's own mind and judgment. And what's a lack of confidence in one's own mind or judgment but a problem of self-esteem? So low self-esteem people tend to scapegoat, alibi, do everything except deal with what needs to be done, where did I miss the boat, what can I do to correct it? It's rather than a self-defense mode than a protecting themselves against uh, who knows what from the higher ups from being... Uh, criticized perhaps for mistakes I made. Of course, you know, mistakes are very interesting. There are good mistakes and there are bad mistakes. What are good mistakes? Good mistakes are when we're trying out new things, we're learning new things, and we're learning what doesn't work as much as we've learned about what does work. Thomas Edison, as I guess everybody knows, was very strong on that point. That he when he would talk about how much he learned, you know, what did he learn? He learned around a thousand different things you couldn't make light with. That's with what he learned. So the 11th thing was what you could do. That's about what I can say briefly. <laughs> well, let me lead up to what, what I'd like to follow up and say to that. For one, it's fabulous. I can totally relate to so much of what you're saying. I know our listeners can also. It also makes me aware of so many times in in my life where I was uh, critical or not accepting of someone because of where I was at, and, and it also shows me in areas where I really have developed and, and have true confidence in areas where I actually do work and flow. And so I, you know, I, I see both sides here. What I do want to mention is that you have such an expansive knowledge on this. You've documented in your books uh, so many methodologies and steps and ways to really go deep, uh, really deep with anything that I'm going to ask you that the main objective of me interviewing you is just to literally give people that may have not been introduced to you or people that, that have just a, a, a better understanding of, of who you are because I would not typically say this so strongly um, that this is one of those interviews that I would encourage uh, every person that this resonates with to simply go out and get your books because there's, uh, there's so much uh, that you have put together and, and laid out step by step. And, and, and the best that I can deliver for all our listeners is just uh, what I feel would be very great insights and understanding and, and methods. But, I mean, I could talk to you for a week and, and still learn, learn so much. So let me ask you, like, how would someone recognize that they have a negative or low self-esteem and, and how can they raise it? Well, there'd be a lot of things. Probably discomfort with self-assertion, 
difficulty with self-assertion with expressing their own thoughts or feelings. That's one. Another is uh, that they are almost the opposite problem. They're super aggressive, hungry like a child, always to be the center of attention, always to need positive feedback to reassure himself that he's okay. Fear in the face of any kind of changes or he has to operate in some new ways. And we know what murder that can be in the context of business today when people are afraid of change, made anxious by change, and can't survive without innovation and change and know that. God knows that it's drummed into them enough. But they can be so scared in terms of the more will be expected of them than they can deliver. By now, they got it, that they got a self-esteem problem. There's no end. I could go on. I could give you more. Uh, uh, for example, you could be in the love affair. And if you were continually, continually wanting uh, your partner to give a new proof that he or she doesn't love you. I mean, we all want to be loved. Let's say that's not the point. But there is such a thing as being excessive, which implies insecurity. And we think that uh, a more self-esteem person would not quite let let that run away with him. Uh, sometimes, for example, I, I wrote about, I think I wrote about that in, in uh, self-esteem at work, but this was the fellow who was the lead fellow in the research department of a major corporation, and uh, very busy, very successful. And one day they brought in another high-caliber scientist, technologist, to work in the same organizational unit, the research unit, that the first man was. Now, from the point of view of the bosses, all they thought was making a contribution, bringing some new blood into the, this unit. It wasn't seen as a competition between the new guy and the old guy at all. But the older guy took it as, this is their way, it's a vote of non-confidence in me. So he's a little paranoid now. He keeps looking at this other guy as his menaces and wondering, and have they told him bad things about me, et cetera, and so forth. And his behavior started to unravel. He was pissed off. He was angry because he felt betrayed. He didn't have good reason to. He didn't have any reason to. He had no grounds not to. He could certainly understand they're very busy there. There's always help for another brain. There's always welcoming to another brain. It's not about one A versus B or B versus A. If you think always in those adversarial terms, I promise you, if you've got a self-esteem problem. Yeah, gotcha. Is this enough? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Last thing I'll ask you about self-esteem, which will, could, could probably be a, a, a long answer, but I'd, I'd like to just kind of have you summarize it. You wrote a fabulous book called The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. Can you talk a little bit about what these six are? And then I would encourage people to, to go deeper with it just simply by reading the book. But what, what are the six pillars of yeah, self-esteem? The context for the listener, let me say, is the following. Working with people for so many years that I was always on the lookout, as I said to you earlier, what works and what doesn't work and what seems to be important for raising the level of a person's self-esteem. And I became convinced that there were six principles which were essential. It isn't that nothing else mattered, but these six I knew were the center and basic for nurturing good self-esteem. And I'll name them, and then I'll just give a word of explanation for each of them. The practice of living consciously, the practice of self-acceptance, the practice of self-responsibility, a practice of self-assertiveness, the practice of living purposefully, and the practice of personal integrity. What do we mean by living consciously? Well, I can only indicate it here very, very briefly. It means, A, respect for facts, knowing that that which is, is, that which is not, is not. It's having respect for facts. It's having an understanding that wishes or feelings are not evidence or proof of anything. More than that, it can be that when I'm thinking of when Jack Welch, who had done such a miraculous job at GE, was questioned about how he turned the whole organization around and turned it to the most successful corporation in the world. What he said was very interesting. He said, well... What they changed, what they encouraged, what they brought to the table was, A, confidence, B, a willingness to look at facts even when they're painful. Well, that goes to the heart of what it means to live consciously, to look at what's there to be seen and relevant to your goals or your purposes or your dreams, to look at it, not about from the, aspect, from the perception of, a, well, do I like it or not, but what is it, yes or no? I do... Uh, a lot of 
sentence completion exercises on the telephone. And I'll give a simple example of what I mean by that here. Uh, sentence completion work plays quite central in my work. So uh, I had a client, a 48-year-old client in Houston, Texas. And uh, one day she phoned me up in this super, super thick, thick, thick Texas Houston accent. Begins to tell me of some new disastrous love affair she's in. And uh, the trouble was she was becoming so upset that I couldn't understand what she was saying. And she was crying and her accent was getting thicker. And I was concerned because I didn't want to leave her in this state. But I had another client lined up behind her. And I didn't have a clue as to what I'm going to do. So I told her every day for a week, go to the office, sit down, pull out a private notebook, write at the top of the page, if I bring 5% more consciousness to my relationship with X, X being the name of the guy, do that for a week, come back, we'll talk. Well, this cheered her up immediately and gave her something to do. She came back a different woman. And she says, well, Nathaniel, of course you knew I had to get rid of that bum. And she came out with a very lucid discussion of, what was wrong with it and why her survival required she move on. Well, here is an example of living consciously in action. We develop techniques to show people how there are exercises they can do that can help them to learn how to function more mindfully. Well, obviously, I can't take this much time for each of these six different pillars. In the case of self-acceptance, it kind of speaks for itself. It doesn't mean condoning or liking. It means simply a willingness to stare at whatever the truth is about what I think, what I feel, what I've done, and not to run from it because it's unpleasant. Look at it, be aware, stay conscious, take responsibility. The third pillar, self-responsibility, what does that mean? It means I am responsible for my life and well-being. It means I am the author of my choices and actions. It means I am responsible for the consciousness that I bring to my work. I am responsible for the level of consciousness I bring to my dealings with my children. I am responsible for my personal happiness. No one is coming to rescue me. No one is coming to make the world right for me. I have to give up blaming. I have to give up alibying. I have waiting. You know, you get this so often in marriage counseling. One person says to the other, our marriage would be so perfect if only he would change, or our marriage would only be so perfect if only she would change. And they don't realize that this is a dreamland. They don't have the habit of taking responsibility for their role in any aspect of life. And so I would always be telling my clients, no one is coming. And one client one day with a sense of humor challenged me and said, Nathaniel, you're always saying no one is coming. But you came. I said, correct, but I came to say that no one is coming. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, the self-assertion has to do with my willingness to stand up for myself, my willingness to stand up for my values and my beliefs and my convictions. Living purposefully has to do with being very clear about one's goals. One must be very clear about what it is we want to accomplish. We then how do we go about thinking through an action plan that would allow us to reach those goals, to think through what needs to be done. Daydreaming is not having a goal. Goals are specific targets that you articulated you know what it means, and you are now concerned with designing the steps, the action steps that will lead you to the actualization. It's really frustrating because I would love to share this all with you in much, much more depth, but I guess the best recommendation I have in this subject interests you and anybody else listening, read The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to touch on it because I want people to at least understand what it's about so they would see obviously the benefit and the reason to go deep with uh with this because i mean you know this is your life work here that you have as far as i know you are the pioneer and the you know the the leading most knowledgeable and when i say you know pioneer expert you've sold more books than anyone on uh, in the world on this particular subject you've probably done more research work study and you know on this and so if there's any person that I would like to introduce to to my listeners that I think could really have a a meaningful impact, it it would certainly be you in this area, and, and, you know, to not, I think I'd be doing a disservice to my listeners to introduce this to them and not heavily encourage them to to read your books and go deep with this, and and even if they wanted to, you do, you know, uh, phone consulting to corporate clients and stuff, I'd encourage 
you know, people that really want to talk to you personally, you actually can be hired to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm personally going to hire you myself uh, to talk about some of this stuff because I'm you know, even just talking to you about this, I see such a positive application. As an example, and then we'll wrap up on the, the six pillars, you talked about self-accepting. When I saw you speak at the conference where I actually met you, uh, this is not a business conference. It was for therapists, but I'm kind of weird. I like going to see what's going on in the you know self-help world, in the therapy world, and people think I'm a doctor when I go to those events, which I'm not. Uh, I'm just a, an inquisitive, curious person uh, that wants to you know enhance my my life in better ways and evolve and. You were taking the audience through an exercise that if I were five percent more accepting, uh, what would I have in my life? And I, you know, was, I'm sitting here looking at those notes. It said I'd have more joy, I'd have more freedom, more peace, serenity, more self-care, more acceptance of others, more fun, excitement, and happiness. I'd make more money. You know, I mean, there's there's not only a personal application, but there's a business application. Then I circled this note that I put next to that exercise, which is you can't leave a place you've never been. And the, the point was that was very experiential, and it was a simple question that only took a, a literally 30 seconds to a minute for me to scribble down some things that would happen, but it gave me a great insight. And that's, that's what I want people to kind of understand, just how it doesn't take years for this to have a, a, a benefit to no, you. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I, I, I love sentence completion because it can move like grease lightning into what are the roots of problems, and what steps needed to be taken to remedy them. Let's wrap up the six pillars. Anything else you'd like to, to say well, about it? Well, speaking of the sixth one, we didn't get any hello from us at all, so just in three or four sentences. But integrity, I guess it's obvious that we betray. We are the one species that can think that such and such an action is the rational, intelligent, sensitive, appropriate, moral, ethical thing to do, and then proceed to do the opposite. Uh-huh. And no animal can't do that, you see. But we even have this unique talent that nature gave us. And, you know, we can. This is what I should do. Clearly, it would serve my best interest to do X, so I do Y instead. Well, is it because people are crazy? Is it because they're delusional? I mean, there are many of those things. But but what is that all about? Well, it's a lot of different things. It can be just that they're even though they know at one level that uh, they would be better off than they are now. At another level. They're afraid of change. They're afraid of leaving their comfort zone because you're asking them to step outside of the ring of the way that you've dealt with problems or frustrations in the past and try an entirely different method, a small example of which would be not who's to blame, but rather what have I done by way of contributing to this problem? What do I need to do to get us out of this problem? Yeah, I mean, they're they're great questions. You, you know, you mentioned let, let me let me mention something here. When I when I um, again was uh, at the presentation uh, before I had lunch with you, you made this comment. You said um, when a person comes for help to a therapist, I oh mean, yeah, was a context that they need an experience, not an explanation. Um, I I thought that was profound. What what does that mean? Oh, it's brilliant. It was, it was actually not originated by me, but by a brilliant psychiatrist. Many decades ago, into the 20th century, or early 20th century, Frieda from Reichman was her name. She was inveighing against the over-intellectualizing of the therapy process. You know, if you come into therapy and you're, you're you've been traumatized, you've been hurt, you've been you have high anxiety or depression, an explanation of why you're having those problems may be very interesting, but it's not what the primary need is. The primary need is. The, helping the person to have experiences, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, that would help them to overcome those symptoms. For example, one very simple experience is the experience of listening to what the client has to say respectfully without being in a hurry for the client to stop talking so we can take over and be our brilliant selves and explain to them what it all means rather than help the client to articulate what he understands of the situation or what he thinks might need to be done. And then there can be a legitimate discussion, to be sure. Being treated with respect or getting feedback that is congruent with what we ourselves are experiencing, giving us the feeling that, my God, I'm, I'm not an outcast from the human race. I can't understand people. They can't understand me. That may be something brand new in that person's life as a discovery. 
the, the challenge if you're a therapist is to do things that will help to activate the self-healing powers of the client. And this can be accomplished by many means, by sentence completion, by energy work, by uh, psychodramas of different kinds. Most of the big schools of therapy have got something right, meaning they may have certain differences, but the, but they are all aware increasingly that people do have internal resources with which they could move to make progress in eliminating symptoms and problems. And uh, without getting into the technical aspects of the different kinds of techniques in, in, in psychotherapy, I think that the, it's good to have as many different colors in your palette as possible. In other words, more than one way to attack a problem. Right. People, you see, don't realize what they are capable of often. They don't realize that there are things they could do that they may firmly believe they can't possibly do. I remember once many years ago, I had uh, an office and I had an extra room, so I, re I rented that extra room to a psychologist colleague. And uh, he left, uh, the man who came in there, left his little daughter of around 10 with me because I wasn't seeing anybody in the next hour. So I said, I'll, I'll look out the table for just a few minutes. She looks at me. She somehow must have known that I was the boss or something there. She says to me, Mr., what do you do here? <laughs> oh, God. How can I tell to myself, tell a 10-year-old girl how, what, what you do here? So I said, well, sweetheart, uh, what I do here is that I help people to see that they can know all kinds of things they think they don't know. And they can do all kinds of things they think they can't do. And she looked thoughtful and she said to me, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. I, mean, that's... I, said, I said, thank you very much. for. The, I appreciate the compliment that always remains in my mind as a wonderful memory of feeling appreciated. Okay, so Nathaniel, um, going back to that comment, when a person comes for help, they need an experience, not an explanation. One of the things that I, I most admire about how you do things is you, you give people a lot of experiential methods of coming uh, to, to their own abilities to access what's internal. I mean, a lot of people in the self-help world and in the how-to world, which is I spend a lot of my time, people are always selling people answers, 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 answers. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, people, you know, they don't need answers. They need the right questions. And, and Thomas Edison is, is quoted with saying that if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes on coming up with the right question and five minutes on the answers. And what I love so much about your stuff, your books, uh, and from hearing you speak, is that you just really give people good questions. Not good, but, but great questions to ask themselves that allow them to have an experience. And so what are some of the ways that you would encourage people to not just learn about things, but to actually integrate it into their life so they really make an effective change? Well, there's a lot of different ways, so just at random, okay? I mentioned earlier that I like to work with sentence completion different ways. But the essence of the method is that I give the client an incomplete sentence, a sentence stem, as I call it, and ask the client to keep repeating that first half of the sentence, but ending it differently each time. And uh, if you get stuck, I tell clients, invent but keep going, talk nonsense. I don't care what you say, providing it grammatically makes uh, sense. So if I want to introduce to help the people how to begin to integrate the things they're learning into their actual life and behavior, I might begin by saying, let's work with the STEM today. If I brought 5% more self-esteem to my daily activities, it's a great STEM because it really are amazed at how much what they can articulate and what they e weren't even aware they could do. You're tapping in like an access code. The sentence stem is like an access code to get you into the subconscious or the unconscious. Or again, if I were 5% more self-accepting, that leads you almost naturally into I would do certain things differently. You encourage people to think through what kinds of things do they see themselves as doing differently and better if they learn to be a little more mindful, a little more conscious, or they learn to be more self-accepting, so on and so forth. How does this affect behavior? 
because you want them to see the connection between their beliefs about themselves and what kind of life they're creating in the world. So you'll notice in uh, most of my books have a, an, an appendix, a sentence completion program that could help them to uh, live more consciously or more responsibly or more ethically or whatever, whatever the particular target is in a particular case. And it's very exciting for me because they are excited because they see like something is opening up like a, a closed vault for decades and suddenly the door is just opened. And that's what sense completion work can do and it's one of the best examples of experience, not an explanation. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, you know, what, what this has helped me uh, in a lot of ways is, uh, you know, I've coached entrepreneurs for, for many years, and the way that I got into that is by obviously uh, doing coaching myself. Uh, and when I say coaching, coaching is one of these overused words where there's a lot of incompetency in the field, and there's some people like in therapy where there's great individuals that empower and help people, and there's others that really don't do much of anything except people keep people mired in their past. And when you can take an individual and just allow them, what you said earlier, activate this self-healing power of the client, I mean, what, what, a, what an amazing shift and a great thing to do um, in this uh, sentence completion. You know, again, going back to the notes that I took when I, when I uh, saw you speak recently, which uh, I wrote down, if I was 5% more self-assertive, which you asked, us to do, uh, you know, I wrote, I would say no more, I would be a better entrepreneur, I would attract better people, employees, joint venture partners, friends, and repel people that I shouldn't hang out with, I would have more money, I would achieve more and create more value, I'd have more joy and happiness, I'd be less anxious, I would be more loving, I would have better relationships, I would not be afraid uh, as of, of things, uh, it would come more naturally to me, I would fulfill more of my own dreams, you know, just a whole list of things, and the great thing about that, and, and again, uh, I'd love to hear your, your insights on this, is that I've read a lot of books. I, I've spent a good portion of my time pursuing how to evolve myself as a person, uh, you know, for many variety of reasons, wanting more happiness, wanting to accomplish more, you know, just wanting to whatever. A lot of times I don't even know where the curiosity comes from, but it's this, this path of, of personal development. And, and what I've learned along the way is that you can know every reason in the world uh, why someone is unhappy by reading a book about you know, happiness or, or self-esteem or whatever, but that in and of itself doesn't make you happy. Uh, like my friend Dan Sullivan, founder of Strategic Coach, says you can know exactly the benefits of, of being grateful or what causes gratitude uh, because you've read a book about it, but that doesn't make you have gratitude for life. And, and what you've really, I believe, have done a fabulous job of, of sharing and, and laying out for people is how to not only understand self-esteem, as an example, but how to develop it by this process. Yes. And so how would you encourage people, because, again, I mean, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's a catch-22 here. Is I, I would love to just pick your brain for hours. But just from a starting point for people that are listening to us here, what would, if, if there was a, a starting point, where, where would you encourage people to start with to really just, go on a path of, 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 of developing themselves and being a better version of themselves and, and reach their potential and, and, and do the things that people are capable of doing. Well, they might want to begin by finding out where he feels stuck, where the person, obviously in the situation you described, the person has a good life and a successful life in some respects but not in others. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. So, and, so we want to find out where he's stuck. Maybe it's a fear of giving up the safety and security of a boring job for a new job, which is much more stimulating and exciting, but there's much more risk involved. So there could be an example of, uh, I would do like maybe spent in completion. The good thing about job A, and then a little later, the good thing about job B, and then uh, if I don't leave A, if I don't go with B, you're hitting all the possibilities. In other words, you're, you're setting up a situation where they can, in an accelerated way, weigh the balances of either choice. And that can be in itself helpful. Or again, one of my favorite sentences that stems to use when a person is stuck on something is, if I brought 
more consciousness or more awareness to this problem, meaning whatever it might be, or you don't have to fill that in there, uh, this conflict. You get the idea? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I even used this. Uh, you know, I wrote, uh, from hearing you talk about the sentence completion the first time I was introduced to it, I wrote, what am I doing to raise the... Uh, by 5% the consciousness of my clients, of my workouts, of my team. And so I, I very much, I'm a complete buy-in to what you're talking about here. And, and that's, I, I, that's, well, that's good to know, obviously. So the point is that, that, that um, one of the more interesting ways you can work with this is if you're leading a group in some kind of uh, uh, program, you, you put them into a... a, a sentence completion program, let's say, or that's what you're going to use. You show them how to, but then you encourage them. You don't give them explanations. You don't tell them well, well, what your problem really is. You just get them pumping out sentence stems until you hear that bingo, and the person gets it. Now he's hit pay dirt. Now he really is feeling what the hell he's been talking about at a much deeper level than normally. Yes. See, that's that's the key. I, I believe that's why I feel what you do and have written about is so much different than so many other quote-unquote methods of people feeling better about themselves or feeling happy. And, and I I tend to resonate with, with individuals that I feel, you know, I, I feel I was even doing some of this in my own coaching without ever understanding it at the level that you do, and it just enhances it that much more. You know, my, my friend Dan Sullivan, to, to to mention him again, you know, he he has a program called Strategic Coach for, for entrepreneurs, and I've known Dan, we've been, you know, friends uh, for over a decade, and when you go to that program, you're not going there for answers, you're going there for questions, and, you know, my, my friend Dr. Edward Hollowell, he's, he's of the same sort of thing, where sentence completion isn't the term that's used, but that is one of the mechanisms used to, to get people to have an experience, and you just have written all these great books and have all these step-by-step processes that I cannot imagine if people just took what we talked about here on this interview and just tested it, take a few minutes and do it, that you would not, hearing us talk about it's one thing, but to actually have someone sit down and write, if I you know, was 5% more self-accepting or 5% more self-assertive and made a list and just see what you come up with, you'll see just how incredible this brain that we have is and what it can actually do when it's when it's properly directed, I guess. Well, that's true, but just to not to confine ourselves to sentence completion, I'll say one other story very briefly of where an experience is worth a thousand explanations. I was running a group some years ago, and, the, the, and I was making the point that a lot of us really did come out of very, very rough and tough homes where they grew up, you know, with very dysfunctional parents, etc. So it isn't that nobody's got a real story. It doesn't change the fact that we have to take responsibility as adults where we go from here. Anyway, this one psychiatrist was very skeptical. He said, I seem to be thinking that just about everybody in the world has been traumatized. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I have never been traumatized. In fact, I've had a wonderful childhood, etc., blah, 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 blah. blah. And I... And that, with somebody, could be true, but I didn't think it was true of him. That is to say, I watched him, and if I, I can, let me put it so grossly, smell trauma. So I asked him if he'd be willing to conduct a small experiment with me. I wanted to take him through a simple psychological exercise, and uh, I would appreciate it a lot. Maybe the you would learn something, maybe I would learn something, maybe the group would learn something, if you're willing. He said, okay, you know, somewhat laughing at me, but it was okay. He's a good guy. So I said, uh, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that you're in your in a room in the hospital, and you're lying in your bed there, trying to get used to the fact that you're dying. You're not in great pain at the moment, but you know the symptoms, and you know that you don't have a lot of time here. And as you're thinking about that, your father comes into the room. And he comes over to your bed and just stands there looking at you and you look up at him. And uh, if ever, you know, you wanted to get a message through to him with him listening, it would be now. Because it may be the last chance there'll be. So what I want you to do is to talk to your father. And above all, tell him what it was like to be a child growing up in your house. I want you to talk aloud. I want you to talk to your father. 
I want you to see your father looking down to you. And when you're ready, I want you to feel free to go right into that and talk to your father till I call time. So we did this for a few minutes, and then some tears began to form and rolled down his cheek. And he wanted to stop at that point, and I encouraged him. He said, you know, I'd like you to give it a little bit longer. What do you say? He said, I can do it. Okay. So then I had him talk to his mother, and it got even more emotional. And pretty soon, uh, through the things he was saying, you were getting a very rich portrait of what aspects of his childhood home life was like. But you also had cracked open the vault, and that he could now feel a pain of a trauma that he had been denying all of his adult life. So that's an example of what I mean when we talk about an experience. You give the person an experience. There's nothing to argue about after that. If you can create the right experience for the right problem, and you can make that issue, which was largely unconscious, now largely conscious, then you've taken a very big step. Then you can get into other things, including playing conversation, question asking, role playing, a lot of different exercises. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much uh, to this, and that that could be done in, in so many, I guess, ways to access it. I what I, what I would like to ask you is, what is your what is your opinion on just the whole state of of, of therapy and uh, self help in general? How do you look at it? Well. It's a very exciting time because it seems to me that every 10 minutes I'm reading about some new work that somebody's doing. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a kid anymore, but still it can be very exciting to read about something new that I never heard of. I wonder, gee, what I, do I have time? Could I could try that out. You know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a great game in a sense. Uh, so I feel one has to be skeptical, one has to be careful about what one embraces. But... Um, Assuming you know you're reasonably commonsensical to know that uh, that there are differences, and some of the stuff that's claimed for it is not that it's useless, but it's not it's touted for more than it can deliver. That's very common. Right. I feel sorry for somebody out there looking to know who to go to for help, because there are so many people out there. Everybody in this world, everybody and his brother, and now seems to me wants to be a psychotherapist. And uh, people often come to me after they've gone through five or six who they gave up on after two or three sessions just felt they don't like them for a variety of reasons. So I think that uh, some of the most exciting work that's going on is in this new field called uh, The Promise of Energy Psychology. And that's a book you can get from Amazon. I can't even think of the spelling of the author's name. David, I think, Feinstein, I think. But anyway, all you need is The Promise of Energy Psychology. It's a fantastic book that covers a whole other approach that I've gotten into today called Work with the Body's Energy System. You know, Albert Einstein in the 1920s told us that a human being is, in effect, a walking energy system. And what psychologists have been doing in the last two or three decades is learning how to work with that energy system to heal unhealed, unhealing wounds. So it's terrifically valuable, especially for working with trauma. Let me ask you about your fabulous book called Taking Responsibility. There's a point you make where you say that we shape our identity through what we're willing to take responsibility for. Uh, Can you talk about this? Because I think it's so valuable to our listeners, that whole subject of taking responsibility. And, you know, again, the statement, we shape our identity through what we're willing to take responsibility for. Well... Yes, most problems have as one of their elements a failure of the person involved to take adequate responsibility with regard to solving the problem. And it doesn't mean that if he or she did take more responsibility, the problem would automatically get solved. No, it won't. may need expert help, may need professional help. But sometimes it's an act of self-responsibility to hunt down a good therapist and go to the therapist. That is also self-responsible. It doesn't mean literally doing everything yourself. That's a big mistake. It doesn't mean never asking for help. Just the opposite. It means taking responsibility for asking for help, for searching out resources in the world that could help you solve your problem. 
that's just background to my answer. I'm not, I'm not there yet at answering your question. That's kind of background context for me. Well, okay, so now here's the deal. I suppose that uh, you come to see me and you're just complaining, my mother did this and my father did this, and it's pretty, it sounds pretty awful. And uh, no wonder I yell at my wife. I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, you, you just can't help yourself. God knows I saw enough slapping of faces in my, my, when I was a kid growing up. And I didn't like it then, and I suppose I shouldn't like it now either. But, you know, I, I, it's just too much for me to handle. I can't cope with this. I, 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 I give off steam that way by shouting. I know shouting in the kids doesn't help anybody, but it helps me to let off steam. Now, here you see, as me attempting to act out, a person who is not at all self-responsible with regard to dealing with his issues. He's got an alibi for everything. He's got an explanation for everything. And who doesn't have an explanation for everything? We all have got our own story. It's not an issue of saying it's not important. Of course it's important. But it's not important in the sense of relieving us of responsibility. It just can help us to make our self-responsibility acts more effective. Right. That's a different issue. You get what I'm driving at here? Yes, absolutely. All of us are self-responsible about some aspects of our life and not other aspects of our life, with rare exceptions. I know people who seem to be pretty damn near responsible for everything that they, in their life. Maybe they are, but I, I've never seen anybody who was, could be successfully not responsible and, and still do more than get out of bed in the morning. So... The big question becomes, what am I responsible for? What's up to me? What needs to be done? What can I do to help solve my own problems? To say it again, it doesn't mean not asking for help. Asking for help can sometimes be an expression of self-responsibility. You know, you know the old joke, I don't think it's true, but the old joke about, you know, what's wrong with men drivers is that men being will never ask a person for directions because, you know, they don't want to imply that something they don't know. I don't know if that's true of all men. I don't think so. But anyway, it makes a point here that it is an act of self-responsibility to realize, I don't know, this person might know, ask. Yeah, well, you know, I, I believe that very much. It's, I'm certainly one of those people that would always ask for directions and think if you're lost and you're not asking for directions, that's pretty idiotic. I mean, ask for directions, that's at least my world. And so I very much admire people that seek out. For instance, I mean, I think there are lots of people in the world that could, definitely benefit from listening to this conversation and reading your books and some people will and others it, they're oblivious to it yep. and i think part of the responsible individual is knowing that if you can get more direction if you simply ask for it to pursue it that's just a good thing that's just going to help your life in, in so many areas so a couple more things i want to ask you and then we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up um you mentioned something in the, the speech that I saw you give uh, that I wrote down, and you said people vote to be right over being happy. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you explain what that means? Sure. I'll give you a very fast, simple example. See, I don't deserve to be happy. My fate is to be left. Nobody really is going to love me enough to stand by me, and uh, I'm destined to be alone in the end, and I'm destined never to really have somebody close who loves me. Now then. I go to a social event, and I meet a woman attracted to her, and she seems to be attracted to me. And I ask her out, and somewhat to my surprise, she agrees. So we go out for dinner, and we begin to talk. And somewhat surprised, I found that she was easy to talk to. After I drop her off at her home, and going back to my home. I'm feeling a kind of a drunken disorientation. So I don't know how to fit what's happening with this woman into my, what my life is about. Well, the answer is probably it's not going to last very long, so enjoy it while it lasts because it's only a matter of time until it's going to be blown up. But for whatever the reason, this woman decides not to be manipulated by his erratic behavior. She knows, she thinks she loves him, so she perseveres. And now he's really getting confused because she's fighting for him, and uh, that's almost like a miracle. And now he can be happy for as long as six or eight months. And then the old anxiety pops its head once again and says, this is not your story. It's not going to be here next year or next year or next year. When she leaves, when she finally gives up on me and she leaves me, I face the apartment. I say to myself, well, what did you expect? 
you knew from the beginning what the story was going to be, and you played it out, and uh, you were right. Now, being right to some people is more important than being happy, because they don't believe in happiness in the first place, except in a very short-term kind of way. We can be filled with malevolent expectations, which we help to become realized in the world. And then we say how right I was. And we get a bitter satisfaction in being right. Where instead one could be challenged the situation and say, okay, where did I go wrong? What mistakes did I make? What could I do differently next time? Let me ask you one more question about uh, about happiness. Um, really? what, what do you feel is at the root of happiness and why are so many people today so unhappy or at least it appears that way? Well, I think that the root of... Uh, the root of a lot of unhappiness is uh, too much stress in people's life, poor health, having to work harder today to live less well than one, than one did a, a decade or two ago, believe it or not. Everything is harder today, and that's a, an aspect of this problem. But um, the root of happiness, I think, has to do with what we are primarily focused on. See, we have a choice. To be focused on what's good in my life, or to be focused on what's troublesome in my life. I think that people who are predominantly happy souls are people who are much more oriented toward the good things in their life than toward the things which are unhappy or painful or, or, or troublesome. I think that people who are predominantly unhappy tend to focus much more on failures than successes. A person who is basically happy he knows there are negatives. He kind of rests them in the back of his brain. So he knows they're there, and he can look at them from time to time, and especially if there's some action that needs to be taken. But in the foreground of his consciousness is all the negatives, and they're brightly lit. When you move to the back of the brain, the lighting is very poor. The back of the brain is the positives in your life, but they're illuminated only very dimly, whereas in the front of your brain which is the negatives, are eliminated very brightly. So we know that what we tend to focus on in life experiences has an awful lot to do with whether we're feeling happy or not, which is why I always encourage people to learn to think what's good in my life and what needs to be done. Think about that. Think about writing an, ex an exercise that you might write every day for a week or two weeks or a month. What's good in my life? Think how many items you can put under that, and then what needs to be done, meaning to make my life happier. You know, if we just uh, have that as part of this interview, um, where people spent the next week um, just writing down for a few minutes every day what's good in my life and what needs to be done, right. that would create a, such a huge experience for people. And so, you know, th there's so much more I'd, I'd like to ask you. I'll, I'll just ask you to kind of any other thoughts you have on that and any famous last words, and then I'd love to have you give out some uh, contact information and recommendations so people can go deeper with uh, everything we talked about, because I think you just have well, really... Well, it's very kind of you that you think that I'm... I don't know if this is a fully response or not, but, you know, I've been writing books for a long time, and uh, one day it occurred to me that there's a kind of a theme that runs through everything I've written almost, and it goes like this. It's like the core message coming from Brandon is... Your life is important. Whether you are happy or not is important. Whether or not you accomplish the things you wanted in life is important. Treat your happiness as something worth fighting for. Treat your life as important. I wouldn't know anything else that I could say that would <laughs> that would be more important and valuable uh, than that. And you know, your your books are not just great books to read. You're not just a, a great writer, but what they do is they give people real life capabilities and they give real people real direction and there's real success knowledge that are that are in your books and everything that you've done. And so um, I'd love to do a, a, another interview with you after we put this one out and see what sort of feedback have, we get. I have a suggestion if I may. Yes. A book of mine that I published in 1980 has just been re was somewhat re revised and updated, and the new edition with the book will be in the bookstores in a few weeks. And the book is called The Psychology of Romantic Love. Subtitle, Romantic Love in an Anti 
Romantic Age. <laughs> great title. And it would be great fun if you felt like it to read the book when it's out there. And we'll do a show on the man willing relationships. Absolutely. I'd love to. That, that would be great. Okay. Well, Nathaniel, um, again, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount, as I always do, reading or listening to you. Uh, very, very sharp guy. And I know my listeners are going to get a ton of value out of this. So what I would, would like to do is not only encourage my listeners to um, give me your feedback on this interview, uh, but also uh, go to NathanielBrandon.com. That's spelled N-A-T-H-A-N-I-E-L. B R A N D E N dot com and Nathaniel, if they want to get further, um, if they ever want to do any uh, corporate consulting with you, counseling over the phone, how do they go about doing that? Email is the best way. Nathaniel Brandon, all one word, at yahoo dot com. I'll also give you a phone number: three one zero two seven four six three six one. Great. Thank you so much. And all that information will also be in the transcripts of this interview also for our listeners. Um, and, again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It was a great pleasure. You made it very easy. The questions, of course, are very interesting, natural ones. But uh, you certainly made it very easy, and I hope it will be helpful, useful to people. Oh, I absolutely know it will. And I, and I absolutely, if you are available to do, do a follow-up, we will certainly do so. And to all my listeners, thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Have yourself a wonderful day, and we will talk next time. Hello, this is Joe Polish. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I hope you found it very useful. Please give me your feedback on all of the interviews that you listen to. I'd love to hear your feedback so we can always deliver a great program for you. Our website is www.joepolish.com, and we also have a Joe Polish Recommends section, so you can take a lot of the ideas and concepts that you hear on my Genius Network interview series and apply them to your business and find vendors and resources. You can go to joepolish.com to find that information and click on the Joe Polish Recommends section. And also, if you would like to find out about more interviews and invest in more useful Genius Network series interviews, go to www.joepolish.com dot geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and eat your competition alive. 